Hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, so we're playing through Eternal Darkness on the GameCube. Continuing the spooky month just a little bit longer because I want to. <laughs> so we're good. We're doing two spooky months. I don't care. I really want to play Eternal Darkness this year. Uh, didn't really get an opportunity to, so I'm going to keep going. going. Uh, this is a great um, kind of survival horror-ish game that came out on the GameCube around launch not too long after that. Um, and I... Yeah, I just don't think it gets enough attention for sure. Uh, it's got its own unique twist on the genre for sure, and it's uh, got some unique mechanics, and it's a little more balanced, I think, than a lot of survival horror that came out around then as well. Uh, just super fun to play, super fun to play. Uh, so yeah, this guy's been talking. Sorry, I'm talking over him. It's not really important uh, at all. Just kind of, I guess, a little lore build, kind of. <laughs> you get more of what's really happening as the story goes on and less from stuff like this for sure. Their attention turns to my granddaughter, for she is the last of my line and the last hope for humanity. Yeah, so they kind of just throw you right into uh, the mix here with an action sequence once they introduce your main character, uh, Alex. Uh, as the guy said, it's the granddaughter of the, the narrator. So yeah, you get your first kind of clue into how this game plays for sure, and it's really interesting. Um, yeah, it's still kind of tank control-ish, like Resident Evil and other survival horror of the time and stuff like that. But uh, as you can see, you can kind of aim in a much better way, mostly just because they highlight everything um, on the person you're fighting. You know, you can you can select their head, you can select their body, you can select all that kind of stuff so it, it's really helpful it was one of my biggest complaints when i was younger playing resident evil it was like yeah sure i can aim up or down and stuff like that but i have no idea if i'm actually aiming at what i'm shooting <laughs> so see alex has woken up at 3 33 that's important um and you know visited by a ghost Hello. in her dream perhaps um yeah who's this this is Inspector Legrasse of the Rhode Island Police. I'm sorry to disturb you, but there's been an accident with your grandfather. I'll be on the next flight out. All right, yeah, and straight to the Royvis family estate. Uh, it's basically the mansion. <laughs> Every one of these uh, survival horrors needs the mansion, right? Uh, and this is exactly what that is. Ah, Miss Royvis, I'm pleased to meet you. Trust you had a pleasant trip. Um, yes. And this detective yes, is a massive this idiot and a place. jerk. And this it's first cutscene is ridiculous here uh, about what uh, he does here. It's you'll you'll see in a second. Uh, this way, but I must warn you, it's not a pleasant sight. I'm afraid there's not much to see. <laughs> yeah so seriously what bullshit is that like <laughs> who does that who's like uh yeah okay so your uncle may be dead something's gone wrong here uh we need you to look at his dead body over in the corner covered in blood and a sheet like they didn't even put him in like a body bag or some sort of actual you know medical crime scene type thing there's like we covered him in this white sheet off his bed he has no head uh by the way so can you look at this Who, it's my job, just great and he's so angry about it too. it's just my job lady it's, is it your job to show people you know their dead family members in the middle of the living room with their head chopped <laughs> no no that's not how any of this works i have never seen anything like this in my 20 years on the force we have no evidence except for the body and what's left doesn't say much Ugh. We don't have a single clue. Well, you better find out who did this. I'm not leaving Rhode Island until you do. There must be some clue in this old mansion revealing what happened. I want answers. So do I. I wish I had some. Surprisingly, the acting in this is not actually that bad. You know, the precedents have been set at this point to kind of be kind of terrible. 
Uh, and this one isn't so bad. So shocked by her grandfather's mysterious death and frustrated at the incompetence of local police. Yeah, for sure. Alex vows to uncover the truth. She decides to search the mansion, the place where Edward conducted his research. If there was a tie to his past and possibly a tie to his murderer, it would be here. All right. So you can see, yeah, we got our own little, you know, mansion, the residence. Um, I'm going to try to blow through this. There's not much to see right up front. Um, you can kind of just look around and see some of the little details and stuff. Last week, rays of sunlight fight the shroud of darkness. It lends an eerie feel to the last few week's events. As the sun sets, Alex will be alone in this house with nothing but the spirits of her old company. So yeah, I guess that kind of gives you the idea that there's actually been a, a little bit of time since her uncle passed away, and now she has the house all to herself. Um, they don't really actually give any type of timeline, of course. Um, as you can see, too, this is a very dark game. They play very well into the name Eternal Darkness, and it's hard to see a lot of stuff. I actually cranked the brightness up a little bit in game before this. I had tried to do a quick uh, recording prior and had some mic problems and had other problems. So I just started over, uh, but it was way too dark. Uh, so let's check this out. Beautiful carriage clock. The hand appears to be stuck, yet the clock continues to tick with the time prematurely set to, oh, permanently, not prematurely, set to 3.33. Comes in, uh, up a few times, as I said. There's a key in the back of the clock, presumably for winding it. Yes. And it's a dresser key. Beautiful. Okay, so there's not much to do in the other two rooms. I'm just not going to worry about checking them out right this time. You'll We'll see. So that door is locked, but she does have... Do, do, do. Yes, yes. Tell me all about this stuff. Okay. We do have a second floor key. And it broke. Don't know if I necessarily had to do that now. Just went ahead and did it. Um, you can check out lots of stuff in this game. This is a very uh, kind of investigative style play. You know, you got to look at lots of stuff. You got to read about a lots of stuff and that and uh, kind of put all the pieces together. All right. So let's just blow through all this. None of this is important, obviously. Spookier things will happen eventually. I don't want to spend too much time just looking around the mansion just right now. All right. For our first clock. Zooming Grandfather Clock seems to stand obviously in the corner, gazing at the empty room with an almost patriarchal air. Blah, 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 just clock hands. Yes. Obviously, we're going to set it to three. Come on. There it is. 333. Okay, come over here and let's grab this sword off the wall. Can't do anything with it yet, but might as well just grab it. Uh, we can look at some of the other stuff real quick if we want. A diabolic drawing of a stack of human bodies, each one cemented into place. What twisted psyche could have executed this drawing? Though disturbing, it is meticulously rendered down to the subtlest detail. The precise anatomy of fractured bones and the convulsions of spines and ribs entwined into a mesmerizing sight. I didn't mean to click it twice. All right. So obviously we got to pick up this. Here we go. A large leather-bound antique book rests upon the cluttered desk. Should Alice read the book? Yes, we should. We should read the book. <laughs> By the way, I do apologize if there's some cutting out and things like that. Uh, I'm gonna, I'll try to fix it in post, obviously. Um, between each cut scenes and you know menus and things like that, if there's like a weird pause, I apologize. Uh, I am playing this through my GameCube. Uh, through a Carby, through HDMI, so, you know, the many different resolutions games had back then between going to menus and cutscenes and actual gameplay kind of makes for an interesting thing without, like, a, you know, something else to manage that on the back end. To think that once I could not see beyond the veil of our reality, to see those who dwell behind... My life now has purpose, for I have learned the frailty of flesh and bone. I... So yeah, the basic premise of how we play Eternal Darkness is Alex is the main character, but we don't really do much with her straight out of the gate. And in fact, it takes a while to. 
um, what happens is we kind of go through this uh, tome of Eternal Darkness we just read, and we're going to learn more about what's going on through the eyes of possible relatives, but at least people connected, you know, through the Royvis family, through this tome of Eternal Darkness, uh, and how it happened through history. Leading to the events of her grandfather being in the living room with his head cut off. Do you believe that it really exists, Centurion? I do not doubt our Emperor's beliefs or his orders. But if we are to retrieve the artifact, then we must be strong and patient. We must be strong. You can kind of tell still, you know, this this the start of development on the N64. And just some of the way... Um, that the textures, especially around the people and things, um, how they're built, um, you can definitely tell it started there. You know, they're very, you know, like his, you know, pieces of his helmet seem basically glued to his cheek and things like that. Um, it's it's a shame that, that this was kind of a trouble development and, you know, that is a reason why we never got a sequel because this thing was troubled from the very beginning. Um, because, yeah, I mean, it's just, we didn't get the fidelity that the GameCube can really put out in far, you know, as far as textures go and things like that. I mean, it looks nice and looks great, you know, for the time and all that kind of stuff. But you can definitely tell that it, it could have been a little better. Things could be less jaggy and hard cuts on the, you know, polygons and things like that. Especially when you have games like, you know, that came out a little bit later, like Resident Evil. And I know a lot of that's pre-rendered backgrounds and things like that. But the character models are, you know, beautiful and stuff like that. And that's definitely a possibility. Even Luigi's Mansion that uh came right out at the same time you know luigi looks a lot nicer in comparison to some of these character models in my opinion all right so we get to play this roman soldier his name is pius um as you can kind of see this kind of takes a interesting approach to each thing you basically play through like dungeons uh because yeah, you start in this this mansion and stuff like that, and you know, very Resident Evil like. Um, but it's very confined. Everything you play is very confined, and this is the same. Uh, it's very like Zelda like. You enter these, the past or someone else's memories, and you play through it. It's a very confined area um, with puzzles and clues within that confined area. It feels very uh, dungeon esque. Ooh, got more coming. So yeah, using more of this uh, targeting system thing, we kind of, on the game controller, you full click in to get into place, and then you kind of half click in to change who you want to target at. Uh, they can obviously attack you and take some of your health away. My general approach is to aim high and knock their head off first, cut their head off if you can, um, and then if it's worth it to uh, chop their arms off or something like that. Not always necessary, just depends. But if you cut their head off, you can stop them from approaching any longer. So that's that's the best method to kind of keep enemies from crowding you, I would say, would be to just chop their head off. So they'll kind of stay in place and not know what to do. They'll still swing wildly, but they won't approach you anymore. Because they don't know where to go. They don't have a head. Away from him. Yeah, you see, full click into attack, half unclick, and then re-click. And if someone's closer, he's too far out, um, he'll just change. Yeah. Target arms, cut their arm off. There we go. And this finishing move comes in handy later. Um, actually, doesn't really come in handy till the second person you play. I'll leave him alone. Oh, it's going to tell me all about, you know, health now. It's got to cut away into the menu for some reason for this. The meter represents life energy. Every time a character takes damage, the level will get lower. Duh. Okay. Ooh, I got to get out of this little grouping here. This game does throw a lot of enemies at you. They're not, in my opinion, it's it's a lot simpler than like, you know, other 
uh, survival horrors of the time. Mostly because you have a lot more attacks with, like, you know, bladed weapons and things like that. You have melee attacks compared to always worrying about guns with limited ammo and things like that. It helps a lot to kind of keep this game a little more balanced, in my opinion, compared to other survival horrors. Whether it's Resident Evil, I'm not, you know, I'm just in a little bit of Resident Evil. I like Resident Evil a lot. Um, it's just, you know, you're very weak in those games. And that goes to the survival horror that is much scarier and tense than this game is. It takes a more, I don't want to say arcadey, but, you know, definitely more simpler approach, maybe. Hard, hard to say, really. But yeah. You're not nearly as stressed out uh, through this trying to uh, fight people. You you feel like you should fight people and you can't fight people. Monsters, enemies, whatever you want to call them. I guess they're not people. <laughs> All right. Our first puzzle of sorts. There's a lot of puzzles in this game. I'm, again, playing through the same survival horror tropes as anything else. Um, you kind of run through your spot, figure out some puzzles, open doors, you know, get to where you need to go. And it's very much based around finding things to place on other things and place in a hole, that kind of stuff. Come on. You don't need to fight them either. Um... Again, once that finishing move has a purpose, you'll kind of see why you want to. This wants you to fight stuff if you don't and just kind of let the monsters kind of take hold of you um, and run out of the room, you it still will kind of, uh, you know, come back to haunt you. You do want to take on the monsters. You do want to take on the uh, horror of the game. You don't want to just let it run you out of rooms and things like that. Which, again, I think kind of made this more unique. Okay, so we get to put these in their little slots. Yeah, so again, very much like other games of its, you know, ilk, it's, uh, yeah, you have to go up to the thing, go into your menu, select the right item, hit use, that kind of stuff. And the last one. I hadn't touched on any of the music yet. Yeah, there's not really any type of uh, what I would say like true music soundtrack type stuff. It's very, every stage uses the same kind of um, song with the voices and the, you know, kind of ethereal, almost Middle Eastern sound. Um, it, it's It's very different. And I kind of like it. I kind of like what they did. You know, you, you're. It kind of helps with some of the horror that is kind of, you know, in the tenseness that's kind of put away because you're you can fight monsters and things like that um, by kind of keeping things kind of spooky and ethereal the whole time. Um, some people may disagree with that, though. <laughs> you know, obviously, there may be a lot of disagreement with that on whether it's annoying or helps the game at all. But I, I like that it's kind of this blend of atmospheric and like ethereal sounds with like just a little bit of tune, you know, to it. Come on. As you saw there, actually, that doesn't happen a lot, but monsters can actually fight each other. There is a little infighting with it. Um, mostly just if they manage to hit each other and stuff like that, if they all come grouped, um, they will damage each other a little bit, I believe. I could be wrong on that. That could be all coincidental, but I I've seen it happen a few times. I don't I don't think they're immune to each other's hits. All right, we're just going to step on this giant glowing thing, uh, like it's no big deal. That's totally what most people would do in real life. Just step right on the giant glowing circle and not be concerned about that at all. Okay, so here's our first big decision of the game. So uh, this game actually has three endings. You have to 
choose each one of these three times and play through this entire game three different times to get the full end. I don't know if I'll actually do that for these, this uh, LP or not, um, but you, you pick which old god, basically, you're going to side with with one of these. And I believe it's power, uh, knowledge, and magic, or arcane, you know, however they want to say it. I think I'm going to go with red to start, uh, just to do it that way. I don't know if any of them ha make anything easier or not. I don't really remember. Uh, but yeah, we're going to have Pius claim the red artifact. Now Pius is a spooky skeleton man. Oh. <laughs> Eons have passed since then, and I have learned much. Chaturga's power filled me. Chaturga. So that's our old guy we just sided with. Could level buildings, rend the ground asunder and channel power such as mortal men could only dream. Face me, and you shall surely perish. Okay, we have now officially acquired the Tome of Eternal Darkness, and we can continue on uh, with the game, exploring more stuff. Uh, that should put us right at like the 20-ish mark, 20-ish minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and call this part one. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I hope you're enjoying it. Uh, and we'll I'll see you next time for part two.